Hey there, I'm Lennox and this is AP US History and today we're talking about the English expansion into the Americas, specifically into the southern colonies. Now originally England had tried colonizing the Americas with the colony of Roanoke, but that failed. So they're going to try it again, but this time it's going to be a little bit different. Let me tell you about the Virginia Company, which was founded in 1606. The Virginia Company is what we call a joint stock company, meaning that instead of one person investing in a colony, it's going to be a group of people, kind of like stock brokers, if you will. And what they're going to do is they're going to create the Virginia Company with the purpose of creating settlements in North America for profit. The very first colonies created in the Americas were created for profit. Jamestown will be their first venture into North America. It's going to be created in 1607 and it will become the first permanent English colony in the present day United States. Now, John Smith is going to become its leader, but he's not going to start off as its leader. You're going to see they're going to have some problems once they get here. When we look at the Jamestown colony, you can look, it's, they settled right off the Atlantic Ocean in what we call the Chesapeake Bay area. They were, like I said, a joint stock colony, but sometimes they're also referred to as a corporate colony or a charter colony. Any of those are interchangeable. They are going to become the first settlers of Virginia. The problem they had is they didn't know what they were doing when they went there. First of all, the men who were on the ship had no work ethic. They were mostly elite, wealthy gentlemen from England thinking, I don't know that when they came offshore, there'd just be big pieces of gold that they could pick up and take home and that would be their fortune for the rest of their life. Well, that wasn't the case at all. On top of that, they didn't have a real strong leader at the beginning, so they didn't manage their time or their settlement well. They settled in a swampy area, and they, because they're in a swamp, it's not agriculturally sound. They can't grow anything there, and they have to deal with pests like mosquitoes that carry disease. So that first year is going to be very tough. Now, honestly, the reason why they chose the, the area they, they settled in, that swamp, was because there were no Native Americans there. They took that as a sign. Honestly, they didn't take it as the right sign. But, like I said, poor management. John Smith is going to step up. He's going to take control, and he's going to make one rule. If you don't work, you don't eat. Like I said, most of these guys were elite gentlemen. They didn't know how to work. But he said, uh-uh, we're all in this together. So if you don't work, you don't eat. And he is going to lead them through that first year. And they're going to get through that first year. He'll make some relationships with Native Americans that we'll talk about later that will help. But without John Smith, Jamestown probably wouldn't have survived that first year. But it's not over yet. You see, the next year, more colonists came in. And... John Smith broke his leg and had to go back to England. So they're kind of back where they started. They go through the winter of 1609 and 1610, which is also known as the starving time. During that winter, out of 500 colonists in Virginia, in Jamestown, only 60 survived. It wasn't looking good for England's first permanent settlement. But since I said permanent, I guess you know what's going to happen. They're going to survive. And a lot of it's going to be due to this guy right here, John Rolfe. John Rolfe is going to introduce a new strain of tobacco that he found down in the Caribbean. It's a much sweeter strain. And once they started growing it, it became hugely popular in England. And the growth of this cash crop, and that's what we call it because they started growing tobacco as a cash crop, meaning they're just growing it for money. They're not growing it for substance or anything like that. This cash crop is going to save not only the Jamestown colony, but it's going to turn the Virginia colony into a very profitable colony. So more and more people are going to come to North America to make their money. The problem with tobacco that we're going to find is it's a labor-intensive crop. These ain't just some seeds you can throw on the ground and come back six months later and say, oh, look, tobacco. It's got to be cultivated. It's got to be, when it's harvested, it has to be dried. There's a, it's a labor-intensive process to get the tobacco they needed to make the money. Now, initially, their labor force was 
primarily indentured servants. Indentured servants were people that would agree to come to North America, have their passage paid, and in exchange they would give a certain time period of labor towards the person who paid their passage, usually five to seven years. And this was not a pretty, you know, working relationship. It was actually very harsh, very cruel, and very few of these indentured servants made it to the end of their contract. And that made it more difficult to get more indentured servants to come over. because so they start writing home saying, well, this, this is a crappy job. This is horrible. And so it was more difficult. So that's when they're going to introduce what's known as the head right system. The head right system is going to be introduced. And what the head right system was, was it was kind of an enticement to get more indentured servants to come to Virginia. The way it would work is I would pay your passage to come over to the Americas. And for paying one person's passage, I'd get 50 acres of land. For you getting your passage paid, you would work for me for five to seven years. After that five to seven years, you would get your freedom and I would give you freedom dues. Typically, it might be a small piece of land that you could now go farm yourself. While you're working for me, you can't marry my rule or you are out. Um, and here's the deal. This is how bad it was. Only one out of every ten indentured servants survived their entire contract. It was a very harsh lifestyle. So it was hard to get people to come. So the head right system really wasn't working the way they hoped it would. Because of the life, because of the low survival rate, new labor systems had to be discovered and brought into the Americas, into the English colonies in order to continue to grow this tobacco. 1619 is a key year. This is one of those years you need to know. This is when the first African slaves are going to be brought into the English colonies, specifically into Jamestown, Virginia. Now, if we look at the history of the growth of slavery, it really kind of started with Prince Henry the Navigator, who in 1415 captured a Moorish port in Morocco. And when he captured that, he took the inhabitants of that port and sold them into African slavery. And he will also introduce African slavery to Europe. Jump ahead to 1500 when the Spanish have started to colonize in North and South America, and you're going to see the first African slaves being brought during that time period. Remember, the Spanish tried the encomienda system first, and that was failing, so they too had to find a new labor source, and that would be African slaves. Over the next, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, Almost 500,000 African slaves are going to be brought into the Americas by the Spanish. And in 1518, you can see there, they were being brought not through Europe anymore, but directly from Africa to the Americas. 1619, the year I just told you about, that's when the Spanish ship San Juan Batista is going to be transporting African slaves into the Spanish colonies. It's going to be raided by pirates in the Caribbean. Not those pirates. And these pirates are going to take the, the slaves off the ship and then they're going to start selling them. 20 of those slaves are going to be sold to a man by the name of George Yeardley, a tobacco farmer in Virginia. And that's how slavery was introduced into the English colonies and subsequently into the United States of America. When you look at the growth of slavery in Virginia, this is during the 17th century, so this is the 1600s. It was very slow in the beginning. You can see 1619, that's when slaves, those first 20, first came in. And between 1619 and 1650, there's not a lot of growth. And then you start to slowly see it going up, and the reason why it grows is due to the growth of tobacco plantations in Virginia and into another colony, Maryland. But 1676 things change even more drastically. And that's going to be Bacon's Rebellion. Very important time that you need to know and you need to understand the causes and the effects of Bacon's Rebellion. This was a rebellion, one of the first rebellions, actually the first rebellion in the English colonies. It's kind of seen as foreshadowing the American Revolution of 1776. But Bacon's Rebellion was between the frontier settlers and the Tidewater planters. The Tidewater planters are the elite planting class. They have the big plantations. The frontier settlers, 
Well, remember I told you that the indentured servants got freedom dues once they earned their, their, their freedom, served out their contract? Those are the frontier settlers because those freedom dues were pieces of land on the western edge of the Virginia settlements. The problem that the frontier settlers had was, number one, the land they got wasn't very good, and they wanted to expand further westward. But there wasn't enough land to expand to because the Native Americans were there. So they were complaining to the local government that they needed them to take care of the Native Americans so they could expand westward. On top of that, because of their desire to expand westward, because they're actually trying to push the natives out, the natives are going to start invading English settlements of the frontier settlers. Tribes like the Doeg and the Susquehannock and the Pamunkey, these are going to be tribes in this area. They're all part of the Powhatan Confederacy. They're raiding the villages. So again, the settlers go to the local government who was led by William Berkeley. He was the governor of Virginia. And they're going to be like, hey, number one, we have crappy land and we want new land, so we want to move further west. But in the west, you have all these Native Americans. You need to push them out. Not only do you need to push them out for the land, but you need to push them out because they keep raiding our villages. Do something, government, because the number one responsibility of government is to protect the citizens. And the frontier settlers are like, you need to protect us. Here's the kicker, though. William Berkeley had his own deal with the Native Americans. See, he was heavily involved in the fur trade, and he got those same Native Americans did a lot of his trapping for him, and he traded with them a lot. So he was kind of hesitant to deal with any type of instigation or any type of arguments with the Native Americans. The Tidewater, or I'm sorry, the frontier settlers were like, fine, we'll just get Berkeley out. But they don't have a voice in government because they don't have any representation in the House of Burgesses. The House of Burgesses was the local government that had been instilled in the Virginia colony. It was a representative government, but it was just representing the Tidewater planters. When the government refused to attack, Nathaniel Bacon, the leader of the Virginia settlers, is going to form his own vigilante military unit, and they're going to start raiding Native American villages. And then they're going to start, and, they're going to, and they told Berkeley, if you don't do something, we're going to raid Jamestown, and that's exactly what they did. They raided Jamestown, and they burnt it to the ground. Now, Berkeley is actually going to be recalled to, uh, to England, but then once the rebellion is put down, he's going to come back. But here's the thing. The effect of Bacon's rebellion is it's going to lead to a transition from indentured servants to African chattel slavery. And when I say chattel, that means they looked at the slaves as property. The reason why Bacon's Rebellion led to the switch, think about it. Who were the frontier settlers? Former indentured servants. The last thing the government of Virginia wants, the last thing the English crown wants, is more indentured servants coming over to North America, coming over to the Virginia colony, and then they start their own rebellion. So why don't we just get rid of that system altogether and move into one where we're really not seeing the possibility of rebellion? Because they're not working for us for a contract. They're working for us because they're our property. And they can be controlled as such. So it's very important that you understand the causes of Bacon's Rebellion. Remember, it was lack of, of good land. It was the Native Americans and, and their rating, it was the lack of representation in the House of Burgesses. So basically, the lack of the government working for the people. But the effect was it's going to cause the growth, an, an imminent growth, of African chattel slave labor in the English colonies. And that's going to be continuous through the 1800s. Okay? All right. Now, when we look at slavery in America couple things you should be familiar with. Number one is the triangular trade. Once slavery came, became part of our system here, it wasn't just in Virginia. As the colonies grow, slavery will grow. And while predominantly slaves will be in the south, they will also be in the north as well. And so when we talk about the triangular trade, what we're talking about is the, the movement of slaves and goods from Africa to the Caribbean 
and to the colonies and then back to Africa. And you're going to, so you know, well, you'll see slaves being brought over to the Caribbean. The Caribbean is going to send slaves and sugar to the colonies. The colonies is going to take that sugar, turn it into rum, and then send it over to Africa. And you just create this cycle that, that's going to last for years. The biggest part about the triangle trade you should be familiar with is the Middle Passage. That was the journey from Africa to the Western Hemisphere, whether these ships were going to the Caribbean or they were going straight to the English colonies. This was the passage of the African slaves, and it was a horrendous, violent passage. It was nothing that you would want anybody to go through, and thousands of Africans died just on the passage over from Africa to North America. So the big question has always been, why didn't the slaves resist? Why didn't they try to fight back? And in, honestly, they did. There was forms of passive resistance, such as work slowdowns. Remember, these, you know, most slaves who worked on plantations, it was all about the cash crop. And they would work slower. And the slower you work, the less money I would make. And that's a problem. So they would have work slowdowns. They would try to run away. There was, there was always a, slaves trying to escape. But where are they going to go? That's the big question. Where do they go? They can't hide within society. And then finally, they would do things like fake their illness or keep breaking their tools and stuff like that. That was a little bit more passive. There was more violent type forms of resistance. Probably one of the most famous ones in colonial history is going to be the Stono Rebellion. The Stono Rebellion took place in South Carolina in 1739, and it was a rebellion of slaves, and the attempt was that these, these slaves were going to rise up against their owners and escape and try to get to Spanish Florida because they believed in Spanish Florida they would be able to gain their freedom. Uh, the rebellion is going to be put down. It's going to be defeated. And what's going to happen is it's going to result in much stricter laws regarding slavery. Another thing you should realize is that when a slave escaped, once they were captured, it's not like they were just brought back into the fold and said, okay, we caught you, back to work. They would be made an example of in such violent means that anybody who saw what happened to someone else who tried to escape they would be too fearful to try to escape on their own. Okay, So that kind of paints the picture of what slavery in America looked like. And this not, it's not just during colonial times. This is going to carry throughout the entire slave generations that are going to you know, or follow what happened in colonial times. Now, when we look at the colonial regions, we talk primarily about Virginia. But there were four distinct regions in the colonies. There was the New England region the mid-Atlantic or the middle colonies, and then you have the southern colonies. And the southern colonies were made up of the Chesapeake region, which are Virginia and Maryland, which I'll talk about in just a minute, and then North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia made up the remainder of the southern colonies. Let's talk briefly about the rest of the southern colonies. The first one is Maryland. Maryland is part of the Chesapeake region, very similar to Virginia in that it also had uh, tobacco plantations as its primary economic focus. Now it's called the Chesapeake. It's called the Chesapeake region because both Virginia and Maryland are set on Chesapeake Bay. Now Maryland was set up as a proprietary colony, and its governor or its leader was Cecil Calvert, also known as Lord Baltimore. That's where we get the capital, Baltimore, Maryland. Now, as a proprietary colony, it was established to make money, but it was also established as a haven for English Catholics. I mentioned in an earlier presentation that Protestantism was, was the, the primary religion in England, and thereby Catholics were discriminated against. So Maryland was set up as a haven for English Catholics, but they welcomed all Christians. It was actually in 18, or 1649 that the Maryland Act of Religious Toleration was passed, which basically set Maryland up as a colony that would welcome all Christian religions into its fold. And what's ironic is while it was set up as a haven for Catholics, Protestants are quickly going to outnumber the Catholics, and they're going to start the same discriminatory processes that they had in England. They're going to bring those over here to Maryland. Other southern colonies, well, you got to talk about North and South Carolina. Originally, this was created as a single colony, just Carolina. The northern part of, the Car of Carolina was 
Crete was made up primarily of small tobacco farmers. These weren't the large plantations. These farmers were still growing tobacco as a cash crop, but on a much smaller scale. They had, because it was a smaller scale, they had a much smaller reliance on slave labor. There were still slaves in North Carolina, but just not the numbers that we see in Virginia, Maryland, or South Carolina. The southern part of the Carolinas was more of a plantation-based society, like we've seen in Virginia and Maryland. However, they weren't growing tobacco, they were growing rice. A lot of slaves were brought into South Carolina to grow this rice because they had been growing it down in the Caribbean. And so they, you know, they had the knowledge, they had the skill. So a lot of slaves were purchased from the Caribbean and, and imported into South Carolina. And they, the wealthy aristocratic class of South Carolina depended on African slave labor. Finally, the last colony in the southern section of the 13 colonies is going to be Georgia. Georgia is going to be established about 128 years after the founding of Jamestown, 1735. It will be founded as a penal colony for English, Englishmen who were in debt. They had been sent to debtor's prison. And the prisons in England were becoming overcrowded, so they're going to use Georgia kind of as an overflow area. Uh, it'll be set up as a buffer colony between uh, the co English colonies and Spanish Florida. There was always this fear that the French or the Spanish would try to invade the English colonies and take them, and there was a real fear that they might come up from Florida. So Georgia was kind of set up as this buffer colony. I mean, it's just a bunch of, you know, prisoners down there. If we lose Georgia, not a big deal. And that's kind of how it was set up. And there was real strict rules if you were going to live in Georgia because it was a penal colony. There was no alcohol allowed. Um, no slavery was allowed. It was, you know, the, the work of the, the prisoners, the, the debtors. They, had, they were working off their debt. So slavery was not allowed. Now that's going to change in 1751. And what's ironic is that's during the, the first Great Awakening, a huge religious revival in the colonies. And it's during that time that slavery will be legalized by a royal decree in Georgia. And it's going to shift, obviously, from a penal colony, and it will become a plantation-based economy moving into the late 1700s. And its crop, wait for it, cotton. But more on that later. All right, so there you go. That's the southern colonies, beginning with Jamestown in 1607, primarily a plantation-based societies with cash crops, really with the exception of North Carolina. And the big thing that's going to be introduced in 1619, African chattel slave labor. And that's going to be part of American history from that point on. Hope you learned something today. We'll see you on the next one. Have a great day.